Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio, podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio. Hi everyone. Audrey. Hey everyone. And I'm your host, Fen. And in this episode, uh, we're going to be oh, escaping. F- and in this episode, uh, we're going to be oh, escaping from various dark, dingy locations. Uh, we're going to. Uh, what was I right there? I'm not quite sure what Rune, Rune Dara is. Is it a dwarven realm? Is uh, a city, a city built around uh... it's dwarves. Yes, well, yeah. then a dwarven kingdom, uh, and then a wonderful kingdom, and then the most eloquent of all kingdoms in the uh, Derbyshire with obsession. And if we have time, we're also going to talk about 1850 Bavaria with Halatal, but we'll see where it goes. Well, um, I've been I've been very busy during the new year, uh, and so I played the bunch of different game, uh, specifically uh, Escape the Dark Sector, which is uh, the game that I'm going to talk today. Uh, but I also recently talked about, uh, played, um, uh, what is it called, uh, Kabuto, Kabuto Sumo? I played, um, uh, what is it called, uh, Kabuto, Kabuto Sumo, I think it's the name? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this will be the third time we've talked about Kabuto Sumo. Oh, well, is it? Written about once and talked about once, and this is the second time. Ah. Uh, in any case, I played it. I had a pretty fun time. It's a, ah. Uh, in any case, I played it. I had a pretty fun time. It's a very uh, fun, tiny game. Uh, it probably couldn't hold your attention for an entire evening, but it's it's pretty fun. Uh, and I recently received a car quest, and I read the rules yesterday, and I probably will play it this week to to. Since the last episode I took part of, I didn't do much, uh, to be honest. Uh, with my husband, we bought the new dungeon crawler Erun, uh, which was uh, made by a French team, and we tried it. So so far, I'm holding out on my final notes as many work, but the team is quite responsive. So for now, I'm waiting to see how they can correct things on the fly. And my second thing is that I have new paints that I am testing the new Chimera paints uh, the first expansion set so lots of new colors lots of new paints that I am testing the new Chimera paints uh, the first expansion set so lots of new colors lots of browns um, a turquoise blue green and I'm very excited to see what I can do with this color especially as the for the first set I bought one of the very first ones in and I'm very excited to see what I can do with this color, especially as the, for the first set, I bought one of the very first ones as the first pre-order and apparently the texture and stuff like that has been improved since then. So I'm very excited to see what these new paints hold in store for me. I... <laughs> Everyone got it. Yeah, but it, it's, I have to say, it's a very little cool game and... Uh, um, I was actually surprised because uh, it had uh, a so so low price, which I guessed it was going board uh, just a few components. And I have to say, while the box uh, is uh, <clears throat> still extremely small, uh, it has everything. The cardboard is thick enough. You don't notice uh, if cards are of cheap card stock because they are fine. So I am very happy with it. And as a result, I I was on CoraQuest.com with my kids uh, trying to make our custom characters using powers and using the builder on the site. I have to say it's a very, a very little nice uh, labor of love. I loved it. <laughs> and basically that's it because the other thing I received in like this uh, four weeks we <laughs> I am not participating in recordings uh, is I got iron clays are very cool poker chips basically you can use to as counters uh, with uh, any kind of games 
you can use them uh, for brass Birmingham, for example. Yeah, that's pretty good because uh, I'm always looking for nice counters and I'm always feeling like the uh, whenever I get cheap ones, uh, I'm looking for something better. So if uh, if you recommend those, uh, I, might, I might have a look into it. Uh, I actually would say that they are of quality comparable to Chip Theory games tokens. So I'd say they are a recommendation. They are not for free, of but uh, I think they are part for the course. Um, they speaking look... of yeah, speaking of cheap theory games, I just wanted to mention that they are making a smaller box uh, for um, too many bones, and I hope ma many more companies follow that. <laughs> we need bones. Yeah, actually, th that's uh, that's a very good thing of them. And yes, it was in the latest updates. Uh, uh, good spotting, Audrey. <laughs> so, uh, what about you, Fan? Uh, well, I've been spending my time building and constructing furniture for the kitchen. Well, I've been spending my time building and constructing furniture for the kitchen. To be specific, a, uh, a dresser. Uh, in Sweden, furniture. Um, it's it's the no, no. It's it's the very best kind of. I I learnt carpet. I learnt carpentry with my grandfather. So no, but I learnt carpentry with my grandfather. So no, no. Um, it's uh well, it, it's a kitchen dresser. But as I'm gonna chuck this out for everyone, uh, no googling. Here's a question for you guys and for the audience. What is the proper name for a country or kitchen dresser? Uh, uh, English. Uh, the the proper know. name well, for a well, what? It's, it's for a, a kitchen or country dresser. A cu they are a tall cupboard, which has um, uh, the bottom section is like so a solid wood wood covered doors or drawers, and then the top section will have like a display section, sometimes for plates, sometimes for cups. Um, America, at least. A cupboard. Mm, that, well, no, it's not even a cupboard. <laughs> yeah, I know a few words that are in the kitchen uh, furniture domain, but I'm not sure pantry is that one. Um, so I'm not sure my vocabulary in English is good enough it's, to answer that question. Uh, ironically, I'm not sure my vocabulary in English is good enough it's, to answer that question. Uh, ironically, that's uh, that's where it um, it isn't quite English, but it's it, well. Did they stole us from? Did, did the English stole it from us? No, no, but no. close. They okay. did, they they did. Uh, it's a Welsh dresser. <laughs> if you ever see one, it's a Welsh dresser. That's because uh, it's a Welsh dresser. <laughs> if you ever see one, it's a Welsh dresser. That's because they were invented in Wales. And yeah, <laughs> they, they stole it, but not from the French. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know the English don't have too much that's actually their own they you know they've got robin hood that's about it <laughs> uh, i guess they got their old kings and crom Be building a welsh dresser in sweden yes yeah absolutely Th that's the way you start a war no no not at all <laughs> i i don't think the swedish have ever had any desire to be at war with wales i mean historically they've spent too much time rucking with russia and denmark mm-hmm so mostly that on the board game front, outside of the games I'm going to talk about today, been playing a fair amount of Ashes and Fleet the Dice game. Um, and uh, sorry, I should say Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born, which is like it's from Isaac Vega and it's my favorite non-collectible card game thing. Um, because they just you just buy a pack and you get everything you need for that one character and it's gorgeously illustrated. Same artist as Dead of Winter. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. Oh, and finally, uh, uh, I got, I got there's uh, more. I, yes. Yeah, I got gifted Vinhos from uh, Vinhos. Yes. Uh, I have no idea what that is. It's uh, it's it's a, it's a Lacerda game. It's one of his two most accessible ones, along with the Gallerist. So yeah, it's. I may have pronounced it incorrectly because it's the Portuguese word. I may have pronounced it incorrectly because it's the Portuguese word for um, for wine. I'd have to ask my friend Leo uh, if. Uh, oh, if vinhos. Correct. Yes, there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I I always want to call it Vin House, but no. Yeah, it's just it's Portuguese. But no. Yeah, it's just it's Portuguese. Word. It's Portuguese wine. 
Uh, I think uh, I think that N and H are pronounced the N, like Vinhos. That's, that's too much effort. I'm not learning how to pronounce Portuguese when I'm learning how to pronounce Swedish. Yeah, well, anyway, as I say, anyway. English, and I'm learning Swedish, so I'm, I don't care. I'm going to call it Vinhos. There you are. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Vin house. No, it's a Vin horse. Whatever. Uh, anyway, um, I got, I got that. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, though. So that's more or less everything that's been going on outside of the astronomically terrible weather, which we're not going to get into. Yeah. We are not here to speak about the weather. We could, but we are not here for that. We already did some weather-related board game stuff. True, true. A weather podcast. Yeah, so rather than talking about the weather, let's just get the heck out of here as fast as possible. So Alexis, can you tell us how to escape the Dark Castle? <laughs> um, to escape the Dark Castle. <laughs> um, so, uh, Escape the Dark Castle and the Escape the Dark series is a rather simple cooperative game uh, inspired by old-school um, choose-your-own-adventure books. The first game, Escape the Dark Castle, came out in Escape the Dark Castle came out in 2008 after uh, 2018 after a good uh, Kickstarter and had later some expansion that came out too. Uh, and the second one, Escape the Dark Sector, uh, is a sci-fi uh, version of it that came out in 2020 with a few expansion coming out later this year, up to four players. Um, and they function the same way. Uh, you have a few characters that you can pick. Each character comes with its own uh, special dice representing the different spread of own, uh, one of the three attributes of the games. Uh, so some characters will be better in strength, other will be better roll, uh, roll them you all different faces and some of the uh, sometimes well some of the dice will have uh, better stats for one or the other um the way that the, the game plays that you create uh you build a deck of randomly generated um dungeon events or um space station events in the case of um space station events in the case of dark sector uh, and as you turn them over you you go through the events uh, and they become harder as you delve deeper into the dungeon. Um, usually an event will be either a combat or test a skill forcing you to roll your dice or to use that or test a skill forcing you to roll your dice or to use items to win an encounter. Uh, you can you keep going up until you face a boss uh, and it will have its own special mechanics. All in all the gameplay is extremely simple uh, and in Dark Castle specifically, it's very reliant on randomness. Uh, it's very reliant on randomness. Uh, there's some push your luck mechanics, but the rolls in the dice and the um, composition of the dungeon decks are the primary decider of whether or not you will win the game. Um, but despite how simple it is, you'll want to go back to it. Uh, the game has a very uh, beautiful. Uh, the game has a very uh, beautiful 80s pulp book art. Uh, all in black and white, and the simple mechanics are usually easy to explain, to pick up, and because of the way that the stories on the cards is written, um, it's always entertaining. Uh, it, it really emulates Dentless and sometimes unfair, but you're always just a good roll of the dice away from uh, victory or, or, you know, uh, grasping it from the jaws of defeat. Uh, and, um, Dark Sector, the, the sci-fi follow-up to the Dark Castle, changed a couple of things. It adds, give player a push your luck advantage for certain tests. Uh, they can reroll certain dice, um, as well as the ranged combat mechanic. And all of that makes the game feel a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more tactical. Uh, the presentation is also better. Uh, for example, you record your life through a chart that makes it look like a. For example, you record your life through a chart that makes it look like a heartbeat monitor, uh, tracing lines whenever you gain or lose HP. Uh, unless you hate the sci-fi teams, I would say that the Dark Sector is a straight-up improvement on Dark Castle. Uh, it stays in. It stays light in the terms of mechanics. It stays light in the terms of mechanics but it reduced the luck factor and it makes things just feel a little bit tighter and a little bit better. Um, and it has a few expansions coming later this year. Uh, expansions for both games add completely new mechanics. 
Uh, for example, for dark sectors, it will add, if you like the base game, the expansions are always a good idea to go with because they can really change the way that you play. Uh, so yeah, those are tiny little games. I think that they cost, uh, I don't remember if it's 30, I think it's 30 euros, something like that. And I would definitely recommend uh, both. I think that Fen, you own one of them. I do, I have the base game for Escape the Dark Castle. And I think it's fine. Thoroughly fine. Um, the aesthetic I get, um, uh, it's, I don't know, like Dungeon Degenerates has a, it's, I don't know, like Dungeon Degenerates has a similar aesthetic and that was a hit for me. This is very, I, I, I don't care, particularly. Um, and then on top of that, I, I find the base game at least is just lacking any a lot of decision space. There's a few times you get to decide to do something, but a lot of it is just rolling. Um, there and the, this felt like one of the most notoriously terrible solo games, which is Games Workshop's Chainsaw Warrior, which sucks thoroughly. It's not as bad as Chainsaw Warrior, but that's that's definitely not saying much because that's like saying falling off a chair is not as bad as having a sword fall in your head. Um, so I I I think it's okay as like a warm up. It doesn't overstay its welcome, um, but I. I kind of wish I'd um, instead just jumped in with Escape the Dark Sector because I f was just uh, because I, f I was just disengaged with it by about halfway through a run, which is not really what you want your character to be almost dead, and you're like, oh well, yeah. So um, maybe it's the lack of expansions that's doing it, but uh, it didn't grab me. Um, I think that's very fair for the end. Uh, I personally really like the aesthetic, but I, I can definitely understand uh, bouncing off of that. Um, but I think that, yeah, the, the dark sectors add a lot of decision space, a lot of little elements to it. And I think that for both game, while expansions are not required, if you want the game to feel a little bit less tight, they're kind of necessary that in that sense. If you want the, the, the mechanics to, to breathe a little bit, to have a little bit more elements to them. Um, but I, I, I would say that as solo games, both of them are okay. They're, they're good solo games, but uh, they get to play with other players because the you know people can bounce off the narrative and have fun with that rather than with the game rather than just uh, the game itself being engaging. Uh, if anybody wants to play a good solo game, I would recommend. Uh, I mean, we, we've mentioned dozens uh, in just a few episodes ago. Spire's but Spire's uh, End. Exactly. Or, or, or even uh, Unbroken, I would say, is uh, miles yeah. ahead of this. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, very f it's a very okay game. But I think that Dark Sector just brings it a little bit further. And I, I like it. That's its, it's style. Um, uh, yeah. I I I that the dark sector feels like its own thing. Escape from the dark castle. As soon as I saw the cover when I opened the package when it arrived, I was like, "This is so heavily trading in on Games Workshop. It's not identical, but that is the Citadel style uh, logo for uh, not logo font for castle, and even the castle. <laughs> it's really leaning into it. But I looked at dark sector and I was like, "No, this this feels more." more of its own place and it less... even has its own legally different uh chaos warriors yes <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, red yeah, maybe, warriors yes <laughs> maybe it would be nice to wait it a while and, and got escape the dark sector warriors yes <laughs> maybe it would be nice to wait it a while and, and got escape the dark sector instead i might have gotten a better impression but then I know what would have happened. I would have played Dark Sector, and if I'd really liked it, I'd have gone, oh, I'll get Dark Castle as well. <laughs> I'd have been like, oh. So, uh, I, I, th I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, th I, I, I don't know. I almost talked about a game this week that had a similar aesthetic to Escape from the Dark Castle, which was Epic Spell. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh my god, pronouncing the freaking name for these things is so... I think that I know that which one you're talking about. Yeah, and yes, it's Epic it has Spell a... Wars up name. It's um, very colourful, that one. It no. is very colourful. And I I think I might do a short five minute in the future point where I just talk about the series. Um, but I don't think it's enough for a main topic. Uh, Not so really, we'll no. See. Yeah, 
yeah it's it's a fun i've always seen that one as a kind of munching like game uh you it's, play around with it yeah. with everything else with the it, it is it's a filler game you can even adjust how long it takes to play and i'll be completely honest it blows munchkin out of the water like oh yeah i mean on, on every games. aspect <laughs> yes I, I know of all of that genre of take that like um competitive against each other last person standing sort of things i'd be putting bang epic spell wars at the top for for choice but epic spell wars is very much like you have a look at the cover of the box and if you go ooh, then it's probably not for you because it's very very offensive style the rule book swears at you well at some point i linked on the podcast discord that escape the dark castle was going to be reprinted in french and i was like mm, maybe i'm going to get this and now eh. Maybe not. I I would say uh, just wait for the dark sector to be to be published in French because it definitely will. And, uh, just wait for the dark sector to be to be published in French because it definitely will. And I think that uh, it's just it's a straight up improvement unless you really uh, love the sort of uh, old styley pulp uh, Conan fantasy aspect of the dark castle. Uh, the dark sector is just okay. is just better by my miles. Uh, the dark sector is just okay. is just better by my miles. Um, and what they are doing with the expansion seem to be like bringing a lot of new stuff to the game and just building up on it, and not just being. The the expansions for the dark castle are, are fun and fine, but most of what they have um, traps and new mechanics that will hinder you. There's a new plague mechanic which is interesting. It's fun to play with. And it's some decision making in the way that you can mitigate damage, but it feels it doesn't feel like you're being empowered. While Escape the Dark uh, Sector, the three new mechanics that they are station, drones, and time travel, I think. I have no idea how the time travel stuff functions, but the, the drone and the mutations are both stuff that can hinder you, but in most cases will be uh, useful decision space for the players to make. So I like that. Maybe they'll follow Anachrony's um, exams. You can get resources from yourself in the future, but further down the line, you're going to have to send those resources back to you. Otherwise, that, that would be very dope. Yeah, it's a fun mechanic in Anachrony. Um, yeah. So is is that it for Escape? Uh, yeah, that's it for Escape. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let us let us clean off all with Alessio and the Siege of Rundar. Uh, Siege of Rundar is a 2021 game by Ludo Nova. Uh, the designer is Rainer Knixia. And uh, it debuted at Essen Fair last year. So uh, it's basically one of the three most re recent Knixia games. The others being uh, Babylonia and My City. And, uh, well... This one talks about uh, the ancient dark dwarven city of Rundar, which was built around the depleted gold mine. Uh, in recent times, uh, a new rich gold vein has been discovered, and now the dwarves have to dig a tunnel because there are assailing hordes of orcs wa wanting to put their hands on, the, on gold, basically. And that's the story. Before talking about this game, I have to talk about how it looks and plays a bit. Because, uh, well, this game is kind of a treat and is kind of cringy, cringe-worthy. <laughs> because basically, you have the game, it is a relatively small box. It's actually a decent, a medium-sized box, which is pretty uh, short in height. And the game plays entirely in the box. When you open it, the box basically is like the uh, fortified city of Rundar. You have walls, you have towers, you have inside sections and the central chamber with gold. And that's actually very, very good. And uh, it's nice to see and play with it. The artwork, besides, is made by Andrew Bosley, who made, uh, I have to say, an exceptional work, but it's high fantasy-ish, so uh, it got universal praise, I have to say, it's kind of meh, because it's, uh, well, always the same orcs, always the same trolls, always the same goblins, uh, 
nothing to say about the trait and the pen, which was masterful, but uh, it's a bit un unimaginative, possibly. <laughs> After that, it has standees, which is actually very welcome because it doesn't. This game doesn't need miniatures, so I, I'm happy to play with standees, and it uses wooden tokens for resources, which are the little tiny pieces uh, uh, lovingly crafted and shaped. Uh, th the only thing which is not wood is the gold, which is actually plastic uh, painted gold. So, uh, the game is pretty nice to see, it's pretty eye candy, but it, it looks also like a toy. So, I think uh, the visuals are uh, very, very good if you like it. Uh, meh or pretty okay if you don't dig the style. That's it. Uh, how the game plays. Uh, basically, in the game, your objective is to dig a tunnel. Uh, in the courtyard by removing all blocks uh, which obstruct the the exit and escape having still some gold in your reserve. Conversely you lose if you have no gold remaining or you have to draw a catapult troll card and there are none left. So basically you are running against the clock and you have a finite resource which is the gold in storage which is the the actual time that you have to escape. Now, uh, in a slightly offensive, in a slightly offensive but in a fun way, the shortest player begins. It's a cooperative game, so every ga every player is a dwarf trying to defend Runder, and the game is your enemy. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the whole point of dwarves. It should be the game is your enemy. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the whole point of dwarves. It should be the the player with the most magnificent beard. And if, if no player has a beard, then the most magnificent hair. Because that's what dwarves care about, is beards and gold and beer. But then I don't ever have a, ch have a chance to not being the first player. But you, have, you, 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 your, you can be judged on your magnificent hair. If you don't have a beard, <laughs> yeah. you judged on your hair because dwarves, you know, they're, 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 dwarves are not sexist. They just hate orcs and elves and goblins and trolls, you know. Well, if anybody read the Terry Project, everybody knows that uh, regardless of gender, every, every dwarf is a dwarf. <laughs> uh, shortest player begins anyway, and uh, everyone takes turns uh, all in the same ways. Uh, at first, you draw five cards from your uh, deck. Your deck is always made of 12 cards, two of which are odds. When uh, you cannot draw cards anymore, you just uh, shuffle all 12 cards, remove two for the turn, and then you make your draw deck. So you draw f five cards and you never know if there will be orc cards uh, in your hand. After you draw, you immediate orc cards you have in hand which will be removed from your pool of possible action and will do something uh, disadvantageous to you. Uh, actually, before doing that, if there are catapults or siege tower in play, you activate them. Those are uh, particularly nasty because uh, uh, when you activate a siege tower, you place a troll, which is a very, very big bed in the courtyard which is the place where you dig to escape and it should at all times be free of enemies. Uh, or a catapult, which basically destroys your chances at, at upgrading. So uh, the more you go onward, the, the nastier it gets. So, uh, Alessio, I, I, I'm just interrupting you for a second because I, I saw the game go. a little bit and uh, it, it has a very... Uh, pretty physical component uh the game right yeah how, how, how would i with the the way that the mechanics works uh very well or is it just through to make the game more pretty uh, do you have to physically throw things into the little compartment of the the game board well the the resources are stored in the box and you actually have them there uh, you don't actually throw stones uh, in the game. <laughs> uh, we were talking about catapults, and I was hoping that at some point yeah, no, you no, able to throw no. things into it. I was excited about the idea of catapults and stones, and now it's starting to sound like this is another tower defense game. 
which, uh, no knock on it, but tower defense is my least favorite genre ever, with only ghost stories getting an exception, and even that's too much for me, <laughs> by the look of it. Which is Castle Panic. It's kind of a tower defense pe- uh, tower defense game, but the victory condition is escaping, so it's, yes. Yeah, it's, that's uh, always the victory condition for me, is yeah. escaping away from the tower defense game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and it's like that. You draw five cards, you play all the cards, which is nasty things happening to you. Then you have all the remaining cards in your hand to play your turn. In your turn, you basically have to dig this uh, tunnel to escape. The tunnel is... Uh, you, you can dig in the courtyard if there aren't uh, enemies in, in the courtyard. Uh, so if the card is free, you can just dig. What uh, What's the problem here is that the cards, the cards you have in your hand are kind of limited. And uh, you try to upgrade your cards to dig faster and escape as fast as possible. How do you upgrade? You go around Rundar, you collect resources, and uh, when you collect resources, uh, you can put them in uh, your upgrade board, which is uh, a set of cards drawn randomly fro- from a deck, which are your upgrade options. When you fulfill the requirement to craft the card you are putting resources over, any player can get it during their, dar- during their turn. And it becomes immediately a card in their deck. So, there's combat. Uh, what do you do to crowd control there? Well, you basically fight the monsters, okay? You get where the monster is, and then you fight them in close combat. You use uh, weapons. You can discard from your end a number of uh, weapon cards, and that will be your dice pool to fight the monster. You draw, you throw that, you throw dice, and for close combat hit symbol you get in your dice, you. Infl- inflict half a hit with the two symbols you get a hit orcs need one hit to be destroyed trolls usually require from three to seven and uh, goblins have a special condition to be destroyed but that's basically it you will have a lot of orcs around and you'll try to destroy them like that the problem is that you have to move a move costs you at least one card to get in close combat with the orcs. So what you will try to do most of the time is to try to attack with is to try to attack with a ranged weapon. What's uh, what's the bad part about ranged weapons is that uh, you use them only from towers which are uh, kind of inaccessible because they usually require two movements from uh, from the central positions of the ball because they usually require two movements from uh, from the central positions of the of Rundar. When you move them, you use two movements to get there, then you roll dice and you only get you roll the same dice you use for uh, combat, but you get uh, at you roll the same dice you use for uh, combat, but you get uh, a hit only with a crossbow symbol, which is one in a d6. So basically, your most powerful weapon, because uh, one crossbow hit uh, equals one damage, is also a powerful weapon, because uh, one crossbow hit uh, equals one damage, is also a thing which will never happen in a two or three dice roll. (laughs) So it's uh, pretty random and that's incredibly frustrating because you fight to get your uh, your ranged weapon kite, to get your uh, your ranged weapon card, you spend a lot of cards to get in position, Uh, you are ready to hit and then you miss, you always miss. Combat is exactly like Hero Quest Combat, where you have the same dice with uh, with the combat hit, the monster defense, and the hero defense. They are three different symbols, and you will always manage to to roll the the bad one for what you need. Wow, wow! That's <laughs> yeah. exactly what I want from my combat. Is oh yeah, you know, I'm looking around at all the different forms of combat involved, and I go, I want to use dice. Okay, cool. And I'm going to use Hero Quest, and they <laughs> suck now. Yeah, exa- exactly. 
the way that you explain it though it seems like the the game mixes a lot of different mechanics i'm going to assume that it's the the fact that all of those mechanics are mixed together that makes them uh work better like it's if it only relied on hero quest's style for the combat if, I, I, as i seem to understand deck building mechanic uh, engine building me a mechanic uh different type of combat mechanics uh, that that uh, countdown going down with the the gold every time that you spend it. I it seems like it uh, together it works better. You mentioned that this game could be played solo too, right? Do you? Okay. Um, I have I have to say this game is uh, definitely more enjoyable with more people. Two to four players is the best. Uh, the game scales perfectly because, of course, this is the turn of one player and it gets repeated all the time. So um, um, it's basically uh, great scaling for the game. You can choose the difficulty by deciding how many HPs uh, the blocks blocking the exit have. So you have a lot of control over this and it's uh, cool. Uh, the solo variant uh, makes you play alone and that's difficult per se but uh, it, gives, it gives you two turns before activating siege engines uh, the siege engines above which are the, the, the worst way the game uh, causes you damage so it actually it's a very valid variant and it's one of the one of the natural things I can say about the game. Now, since we are about judging the game, I have to say what I find cool and what I find bad about this game. This game, uh, what's cool is well, it plays in the box. It's actually very very uh, satisfactory to play this game because you you open the game you you open you open the box you start playing. You just need the room for the upgrade uh, board otherwise everything is in the table that's always really really fun yeah yeah that that, that does ask a like beggar a fairly important question so you open it up and you take the lid off and put it to one side like dice forge yeah uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know some stuff can be outside, but mostly it's contained in the box. So I have a fairly important question, which our listeners will cat friendly, is it? Uh, <laughs> no, <Yes! laughs> it's it's actually uh, very cat friendly. I I uh, I have to say uh, my only uh, Guinea pig, or actually Guinea cat, is uh, a stray cat I picked up uh, last year. So it's pretty pretty diffident about boxes i just left the box containing siege of rundar which is very fitted and it's the place where the cat sleeps now so i i'd say everything is very cat friendly what you're describing here seems very complex uh but as you said the game looks like a toy so how kid friendly is it uh i can play this game with my seven year old to a decent amount of completion. <laughs> that said, my, my kid always want to go and smash orcs. So uh, basically, he, he is not exactly the, the tactical player, but uh, it can be played with kids, not with small kids. My four-year-old uh, uh, basically doesn't play. Not a lot of uh, games are four-year-olds really, though. Yeah, exactly, and uh, and uh, the game looks, uh, it's a Knixia game in this, it has a few systems, which is weird for a Knixia game, which usually focuses on one system and does it to an immense depth, and it has a lot of depth. This game is ruined by randomness, two kinds of randomness, randomness in combat, which is incredibly frustrating because when you are going to eat that troll and you'll try to eat it, you just roll five dice and you roll two one hit and three crossbows. Because that will happen and you won't use crossbows in uh, close combat. When you get to the tower, you never get crossbows. <laughs> and I had a w one last question because... Um... The way that you describe it, it seems that you have a lot of options during your, your turn, a lot of things to do, uh, and you have that countdown mechanic. Uh, how long is the game in general? That depends on your luck, but I say that, that we'll always play in less than an hour. 
uh, I'll say 40 minutes because it's easy to set up the game as its own insert because it's how you play the game. You just uh, have a lead in the center part where you should store stuff. Uh, if you uh, use scotch tape to make that lead uh, something like a porcolis, you just uh, <laughs> you just can store, uh, set it up uh, and uh, clean up uh, in five minutes total. So it's very, very fast to to set up, tear down, and you can play with people with people who knows how to play, I'd say always less than an hour, probably 40 minutes. And that's it. Basically, if you like HeroQuest, this is another genre of game which has the same kind of uh, reward and frustration. If you are a Knizia fan, you should probably play Babylonia from Ludonova, because that's the most Knizia you can get in the last years. If you want a co-op, which is also action-packed and are already tired of other games like uh, Bargol Bros or Bargol Bros True, then this is what could work for you. Uh, I, I say my evaluation is globally on the positive side, but it is a six and a half, a seven on a good day. Wonderful. Fair enough. Speaking okay. of wonderful. <laughs> yes, speaking of wonderful, <laughs> it's time to go from a dwarven kingdom to a wonderful one. Uh, Audrey, do tell us all about it. Tell us all about it's a wonderful kingdom. Yes, it's a wonderful kingdom, which Board Game Geek has written as a 2022 game, but some might argue that since Kickstarter delivery started in 2021 and some store uh, availability was in 2021, we could debate on that. Uh, it's a game designed by Frédéric Gerard and published by Gerard and published by a French publisher La Boîte de Jeu, which means the games box. Uh, and the illustrations are made by Anthony Wolf. It's the same duo as It's a Wonderful Kingdom that I already uh, spoke about. The main engine of It's a Wonderful Kingdom is based on the engine of it based on the engine of It's a Wonderful World. We have again a drafting and building games uh, with three phases in turns and which plays over four turns. This is exactly the same. The main difference between It's a Wonderful World and It's a Wonderful Kingdom is that in It's a Wonderful Kingdom, the game is... This is exactly the same. The main difference between It's a Wonderful World and It's a Wonderful Kingdom is that in It's a Wonderful Kingdom, the game is really specialized for two players. So this will change a bit the drafting uh, phase and the other phases don't change much other than the game being just a bit tighter. Other phases don't change much other than the game being just a bit tighter. There is uh, There are four resources instead of five in the game which makes things a bit tighter. So the main change is about the drafting phase as I said. So in, in It's a Wonderful World each player gets seven or ten cards if you're playing one, give to another player, get another one, give to another player, etc. in rounds. But that is completely changed in It's a Wonderful Kingdom where the board has two drafting spots. Every turn a player will take two cards and put them into the drafting spot, however they want. The player can put two cards in the same draft fight or one card in each. And then there will be uh, the other player's turn which will take cards from one drafting spot and then put two cards in the drafting spot. So that's going to circle until the players have all exhausted their cards. So that's very simple. Player has one trap card. One, um, it's I think it's malediction in French. In, it's calamity in French. I think in English it's probably calamity, uh, which gives minus four victory points. And what you want to do is give the other player your Calamity card and not end up getting the other players. So to do that, you will have to be smart and put cards where you want the other player not to take them, if these are the cards that you want to get from your hand, or put them somewhere where you are going to give them to the other player and hopefully try to give that Calamity card. But how do you make that possible cards all the time? Then what happens? That's where you have two tokens. Uh, I don't remember the names of the token, but they have high eyes on them. And you use this token to hide cards. You put one card in the drafting phase and you put the token on it. You can put the two tokens that you have 
at the same two tokens on them and the cards hidden or one on each rafting spot. It's really however you want. And that really introduces a kind of bluffing uh, mechanics in the game. So that way you will try to put the Calamity card where you think the other player is going to take the, the cards because you think that the other players will want the... And you are going to try that way to give the other player your Calamity cards and try to think of where the other player will try to put their own Calamity card and try to avoid that one. So there is that bit of uh, bluffing element, and uh, then the rest. Then the rest of the game is the same as it's a wonderful world. That said, among all the cards that you picked, you decide which ones you recycle to get resources, which ones you want to build. You put the resource cubes on the cards you want to build. And then you go to the production phase where you produce your resources and you put them on the card. And then you go to the production phase where you produce your resources and you put them on the cards to build. And then you go back to another turn. There is a solo uh, variant as well as in Not So Wonderful World where you again as have the mechanic of some cards are visible, some cards are hidden, um, and you can uh, um, and you can. Um, there, use your the, your eye token to see one of the hidden cards to make sure that you don't pick a uh, calamity card. That's for the basic of the game. Then it comes with uh, five, I think, modules, and in each game you have to pick a module. It all have on the rule book a difficulty level and an interaction level. I think that's really great because that way you can adapt your game to who you're playing with. The first module is quests. Basically, you just have um, an extra board where there are different levels to make a quest and you pay resources. So there is really minimum um, interaction between the players because fulfilling a quest gives you more resources but don't affect the other player. And there are other um, modules which uh, are much harder to use but also make more interactions with the other player. So it's, it's very different in the deck. And this character, you can pay them some tokens to get uh, extra powers. One of these powers is every Calamity card is worth double the loss of points. And that can hurt. It's, ex it's an expensive power to pay with uh, soldier tokens, but uh, it's a lot. And you get these soldier resources. So um, if I understand correctly, those, are, those different modules are not just difficulty modifiers, but uh, change the way that the victory points are assigned so that they change how the, how the game functions, basically. So you have different game modes. The, they them. change more how, how points are scored. You still score points the same way, but uh, they will change ways to score some points under a category. But, but you, do, would you, you would say that um, like two modules definitely change how the game is going to be played. For now, I've tried the quests and the, I think, quests and the, I think it's advisors uh, in English modules. I haven't tried, uh, there is a um, menace module, which is uh, much more uh, interactive. And the quest and the advisors module don't change much in the game. Okay. And so what, what, what was interesting for me in, in the game? Okay. And so what, what, what was interesting for me in this game is that I'll be honest, I've already talked about It's a Wonderful World, but I <laughs> suck at it. And I suck at It's a Wonderful Kingdom uh, right off the box because the bluffing mechanics is something that I am very bad with. But uh, since there is the solo, but uh, since there is the solo mod, uh, husband and I played the game and together we did that together, and we were tr talking about we are going to do this decision because we think that this way, this way, and we do plan to play another game, but versus game, not a uh, co-op solo cup about what we do why we think we do that why we think the other is doing that or what we think the other is doing to train yourself at the game basically <laughs> Ex at the game and also that's some that's a skill set that can be used in other games and i think that's uh possible in it's a wonderful kingdom because the engine of the game is not complicated you have cubes you put the cubes there and you build something that lets you build more cubes or get score points it isn't complicated so the, the that possibility of talking and experimenting and discovering and understanding the things are really uh, made easier by the 
car engine. I see. Um, I remember that uh, It's a Wonderful World uh, was extremely fun, but I had one thing that was slightly frustrating is that it ended up extremely quickly, when it felt like you would need one one or two more turns to to build your engines or like uh to to really get things going which get things going which yes. i'm sure is the point and and how it's supposed to function but uh does yes is, did uh it's a wonderful kingdom fix this no it, it's it's exactly the same it's exactly the same but then i mean I, we we ended up in the solo game scoring i think 40 50 points and then we see all the people on the french communities being like people on the french communities being like yeah i scored 120 points what how what what did you do that i'm not doing ah so so i i don't really think that it's a matter of the game is too short but that again i suck at it <laughs> but uh i don't I, the game doesn't uh toss that to me in the head and say oh you suck the game is like yeah you need to understand me you need to 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 make love to me you see <laughs> I mean, that's a bit of a stretch uh, to say that uh, that way, but it's really a game that's easy to understand, but very hard to master. Yeah. Uh, in my yeah. Uh, in my opinion. And so yes, it's a game you play, replay, replay, replay again, and get yeah. good. Yeah. That's that's what seemed to be so great about it. It's a wonderful world. Um, you you on both game and you've played uh, both. Uh, would you say that it's an improvement? That's just like a different version of it. That uh, like, what's your opinion compared to to Wonderful World? I would say that uh, it depends on the kind of players. If you want more interactions with the other player, get it's a Wonderful Kingdom. But you will be limited to two players, definitely. Uh, if you feel like, yeah, I like to build things. Get it's a wonderful world, even if you are two players. So I would say that yeah, needing or not needing that uh, interaction part is really the the key component. So um, so you're saying it's a wonderful world is more kind of what they call multiplayer solitaire. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I With Audrey, I I liked the game a lot, but I definitely like the only interaction that I had with her was looking at what cards she used, what she wanted, and try to not give her the the, the cards that she might need and try to block her sometimes. But my my game and my plan was definitely more important with her bolt. That's that's like all of my focus was on what move am I going to do next rather than how can I block Audrey's unless I saw that she was going for like some some very high points but except with the specific uh, modules in It's a Wonderful Kingdom it's a bit the same you, you still have that element of bluff, the same you, you still have that element of bluffing to give the, the calamity but I'm not sure if that's enough for the people that want the interactions they will probably need to use uh, one module which increases the, the interaction but, uh, level but at least it has that module and it also has the, that bluffing mechanics on top of it and I'm going to assume it has that module and it also has the that bluffing mechanics on top of it and I'm going to assume that uh, I, I've not played It's a Wonderful World with four player but I'm going to assume that with four player it's even less attention to other players board. at least I, I know that for me when I play those those kind of games uh, if there's if there's two players I might be uh, if there's if there's two players I might be able to to focus on what the other is doing if there's four players I'm just going to focus on what I'm doing yes because in it's a wonderful world if you are two players you know that the 10 cards that you have at each turn there will be one less but one turn uh, once every two turns you will have these cards back into your hand, rotating so much that you can't plan and say oh I'm going to pick this one and hopefully the next time I have this deck yeah. in my hands I'm going to take this one you just can't plan on that when you are four players so one thing that I have to say Alexis is Yes, if, if, if next time you, you visit us, I would love to see you and husband play this game. I think that <laughs> it will be... No, no truly, I uh, can have the right mindset for the game and I would love to see that. Well, I'm looking forward to that then. So, Wingspan with beautiful combos. I haven't played Wingspan, so I can't tell. I'm sorry. But it has beautiful combos. Yeah, it was giving me a little bit of um, Race to the Galaxy vibes, which isn't a bad thing. Which is a lot to say. Um, not really. When you think I can play a game of Race to the Galaxy in ten minutes, so <laughs> a lot of plays in number. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh yes. yeah. Uh, 
that as well. Uh, it's a wonder of freaking gun takes something like 30 minutes, 30, 45, but I am pretty sure the experienced player that end up at 100 and something, something points, uh, they play faster than that. Yeah, I imagine. I'm it's, pretty sure. Yeah, I imagine it's very much like you get used to the early plays, which ones are more optimal for what you're trying to do, or like certain what they call signposts, which is like a card you'll get that says you should go in this direction. Um, that's probably quite a strong thing that happens within the probably quite a strong thing that happens within the game, and that'll speed it yep. up. Yep. Very yep, cool. Exactly. Yeah, I like that kind of stuff. Speaking of wonderful kingdom, the original fairy tale castle is in Bavaria. And its countryside has a strong sheep economy, which is explored in <laughs> Halatau, which is a board game released. Halatau, which is a board game released last year from Uwe Rosenberg, um, who is, in my opinion, a very inconsistent designer. For every great design he's done, there's been ones I've just bounced off like crazy. Um, Halatau is one that I've bounced off and enjoyed immensely. Uh, the Hallertau is Bavaria in Germany, and luckily both of our German podcast members aren't here today, so I don't have to deal with hearing anything about Bavaria and how it's not really Germany and how dare everyone think of uh, Bavaria when they think of Germans, because they're not. Um, but Bavaria is like the source of, I think it's something around 8% of the world's hops. It's, it's a huge area for brewing. It's massively important. Uh, it, Halatau itself is set in 1850, when that's kind of the turning point where the place became what it is today. Um, you, you play a like a chieftain or a leader of a small little village, and it's, it's another Uwe Rosenberg work, worker placement farmer game. Um, so if you played a grit killer or caverna you kind of have an idea about a lot of what's going on but there's I'm, some interesting twists i'm looking at the board right now and i have to say you uh, know the i cannot i cannot uh not see caverna in there yes yeah there is you know there's a lot of uh, very familiar things um what's interesting is there's a worker placement mechanic where first of all your workers are cubes for some reason like really I find that immensely perplexing given all the other resources are nicely shaped. I don't know why they had to be blue cubes. You're not cut off from a place, uh, a, a choice on the worker placement board section if somebody's already been there. Um, each one has a space for one worker and then a row above it for two and then a row above it for three. So technically the same action can be used three times. It just costs more and more. And gradually as the game progresses, it will clear out these the top rows. More like open and pleasant than Agricola, which is an oppressive, depressing mess to play where everyone fights over family growth. You don't worry about that here. It's lovely. It's great. And um, it has a nice mechanic of the fields. If you don't use them, they go up in fertility. If you use them, they drop down. So that's quite interesting for put some hops in here or some uh, reed or whatever and or wheat. Um, and I get two. But if I leave it a year, I'll get three the next year. It reminds me a little bit of uh, viticulture in that way. Yes, yeah, there's a little bit of viticulture in there. Um, what? So you're basically trying to build these resources to improve these set of buildings. Build these resources to improve these set of buildings on this sliding grid. And once you've completed a row, you get to slide your family house across, which is uh, in itself an interesting German phenomenon that I've seen. I went to the uh, Schwarzwald, I think it is, the Black Forest, which is a in place entirely like marshy. Okay, there's no roads. There's kind of everyone gets around by boats. Um, it's it's a, if you ever go to Germany, it's a fantastic place to have a tour. Make sure you have someone who speaks good German though, because they they don't speak English there very much at all. But there was a house there which had like 50 people, all from the same family, living within it. That was how big it was. It was just a big one of these big old family farming homes, and that's kind of what you're moving along here. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I recognise that. Um, there's also a weird mechanic where if you get sheep early in the game, they can die of old age, but you can stop them from dying of old age by shearing them. So is that how I, it works? Uh... No, uh... no, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's really weird. Like of all the things to decide, it's like, okay, we can have sheep, we can milk them and we can shear them. Okay. And then they grow old and die. But if you remember to shear them, then they might not. And if you get them later in the game, they never die. So it feels a bit weird. It feels very, they never die. So it feels a bit weird. It feels very much like a mechanic for the sake of it. I thought sheep milk was enough of an oddity, but fine. 
Well, um, they do ship uh, cheese. Do I know? But I, it's just already like okay. I, I have to think about milking my sheep, and I have to think about my sheep um, dying of old age. I mean, if well, we sheep, and I have to think about my sheep um, dying of old age. I mean, if well, we have to talk about all the things that we can make cheese from, I'm ready for it. My French cheese is ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they die of too much uh, wool. They don't die of old age. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's so. They, they suffocate over, under the wool. They o they overheat and explode. Yeah, <laughs> load. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, most of the resources you can get by for yourself, but the, there's meat which you can't get except via worker placement, which involves trading, which is a bit odd because they're sheep. They're typically known for meat and wool, but you can get hide by trading, or you can get hide by butchering sheep. It does. I think I'm now realizing I just refused to butcher any sheep because I was too interested in making sure they didn't die of old age. Well, that's uh, that's very fair. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, and then, because this is an Uwe Rosenberg farming game, you've got piles of decks, and these decks are different types of decks that do different things, and you can even change some modules, and you can even change some modules on them and everything, like there's a hops deck, which is the first one recommended, and you do lots of stuff with hops. Um, it, it flows quite nicely, but here's the rub. I played this with four players. It sucked. It's, you're sat there with your cards, your objective cards in hand, and you can't get anything done. And you watch your house, and you watch your house like fail to move across because everybody's competing for the same stuff. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is like playing a grit killer four player again. I'm not going to like this at all. And I played it two player, and it was okay. It was wasn't so bad. I felt like I could I at least had some space. I could do things and everything. But I was like, you know what? I'll give it a go solo. And that's what I'm recommending it for. Solo, it suddenly becomes this lovely, peaceful, kind of almost zen-like puzzle where you get given your objective cards at the start. You sit down and you go, okay, what can I do? Uh, what do I need to do? Which areas are a bit expensive right now? And I need to wait for the game's mechanics to reduce the cost. And, and how can I handle this? And the flow of the game, the actual making of the goods and storing the goods and improving your buildings and clearing boulders with tools um, and all these little things which were fiddly and annoying and frustrating when you're competing against other players, it just becomes other pieces. And that's the pieces. And that's what I think I'd like to recommend Halatau as is if you're looking for an expensive solo playing game about farming, this one is probably the best one I've played. Although I think as a pure solo game, uh, it's only Uwe's third best game because A Feast for Odin is his, for Odin is his best and Nusford is his second best. But uh, that's it. That's Halatau. Um, and it gets a solo recommendation from me and on everything else, uh, I, I wouldn't play it. This is a very uh, solo friendly uh, episode. Yes. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very pretty. Very, very pretty. Like, it always looks nice, all the pieces out there. Um, apart. Uh, yes, I have a question. The sheep, yep. are there tokens, card, me they're, 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 they're wooden <laughs> sheeples. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, they, this looks very nice and a lot less. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. I, I have always preferred Caverna, but Caverna is uh, extremely uh, heavy uh, to carry around, to put on the it table, to, to set up, to explain the rules. Uh, how lightweight is it on that on that regard from your um, point of view? It's hang on. I mean, not not just like not not just like specifically weight size, but like uh... mechanically, it's listed as expert level. Weight wise, um, it weighs less than obsession. Not that you have that for uh, measurements at all, but it's not. I don't. It's it's a um. It's like a, uh. You you know the larger box size that like Puerto size that like Puerto Rico and things come in. It's about that height, but it's a bit thicker. Um. However, it's got that classic problem of a, a of a German euro where everything's just sitting in baggies and loose in the bottom. There's no tray or anything, which is fine. Um. But it does mean once you've unpacked it, there's a lot of empty air in there as well. There as well. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, we, we need smaller boxes, as I said uh, at the very beginning of the episode. Speaking of which, I saw the uh, fourth box uh, at the game store the other day. It's tiny! <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think nothing beats... Uh, and... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think nothing beats uh, an annoying game about small boxes. 
<laughs> well, that was extremely interesting in a game that I might look into for um, single play to, uh, player time because I like that those kind of um, like economic puzzles. Uh, that yeah. Game. Yeah, it, it's definitely a really chill puzzle. Um, the time is listed 50 to 140 minutes, but I reckon solo, uh, this is less than an hour easily. Um, and it, it does enough to randomize. It's got the good kind of randomizer, which will work at, um, like some of the rows are a little junked up with workers just to not give you freedom of everything you want and the objectives you get and the objectives you draw along the way but that all feels like input randomness it's not like i've rolled a dice and i can't do what i wanted to do it's more of oh i've drawn this card and it says if i get these these three hops and these three wheat then i will at the start of every round get this bonus every single time or i'll get a certain number of points at the end of the game and that it just feels good it, it does it's it's yeah like it's like making it build, building a puzzle so i think that is all we have time for i think that is all we have time for thank you very much for listening to the last standee you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or follow us on the as the uh, or follow us as the last standee on twitter or subscribe on your preferred podcast app so it's bye bye goodbye from alessio uh, bye goodbye from alexis <laughs> From Belgium, au revoir. And myself, and remember that the second E in Standy is for you, or Uve if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs>